My name is Paul Leenhout. I'm originally from Holland, but um, moved to Texas 11 years ago. Actually, I used to live in the, the heart of the old city of Amsterdam, which is mainly 17th century. I had a beautiful view on what they call the Skinny Bridge, beautiful wooden bridge which you had to open by hand, not anymore, but. And then I was very lucky to be able to move to the Pampas of Texas, <laughs> meaning actually the University of North Texas, um, where I started working as the head of the early music program and also as conductor of the uh, UNT Baroque Orchestra. Um, of course, quite a change. Um, especially in the surroundings, but I absolutely adore being here. Uh, such wonderful people to work to work with, and uh, it's interesting. Very often, when I go back to to, to Europe, in particular Germany, um, people ask me, "Is there any culture in Texas?" And then the first question I have for them is, "Have you ever been?" And very often the answer is no. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's sometimes interesting when you're from, from a different continent that people are not aware about the, A, the interest and also the amount of activities. And um, uh, since moving here like 11 years ago, I was just flabbergasted how many dedicated people I have met in the music world. And, that's partly instrumental, but also like uh, choral activities. And, and there's so much beautiful music happening also in churches. I'm, I'm deeply impressed with this. Before that, uh, I taught at the Conservatory of Amsterdam for 18 years. And maybe the 25 to 30 years before that, I've always been a touring musician with an instrument which you would never expect. <laughs> to go on tour with, uh, and very often regarded as an educational pencil almost, uh, which is called the recorder. Um, here we see a beautiful historical, it's actually the oldest, uh, the oldest uh, organ in Texas. It's a Swiss house organ from around 1770 or something. Um, of course, there's more to tell about it, but in a way, when you, turn a recorder upside down, it comes very close to an organ pipe. The main difference, of course, that uh, a pipe in an organ is not directly blown, and a recorder has finger holes in every single pipe. Uh, but uh, you see just the variety of pipes, and to be honest, if, if you would just actually discover all the different types of recorders, you would come close to 130, 140 instruments. And most people grow up also like, or maybe sometimes they were even forced to play it in, in school for a year or, or less uh, to play what we call a soprano recorder, which is exactly the wrong name for it. But as we know, many instruments are named after the human voice, soprano, alto, tenor, bass or baritone, you think about saxophones, uh, you name it. Uh, a soprano recorder actually is sounding an octave higher than the human voice, soprano. Uh, the recorder is quite old, you know, I think the oldest instrument, uh, which is still in The Hague in, in, in the museum, uh, is dated 1280 or something, so it's amazing. So also for this concert, I came up with the idea of, of creating um, a mostly 17th century German program. I'm sure most of the names won't sound familiar. Um, and it's not like as an artist, I just want to be a bit over the top and, and come up with completely unknown material. But very often uh, I think, why? Why is it like this that this person is not more known? Uh, and, and most people thinking about Baroque repertoire, they always come with the names 
B-A-C-H or H-A-N-D-E-L. And especially the latter composer is maybe almost overperformed in, in, in this continent. Uh, nothing against their music, don't get me wrong. It's, it's beautiful uh, and there were definitely masters. But there are at least three, four, five thousand more masters who were simply not very lucky in their life maybe to get their music published or got lost. So uh, I, I really tried to put this in this program, which I gave a German title, Aus dem Fenster gesprungen. That means uh, jumped out of the window. Uh, a few reasons uh, why this title was being born. First of all, I think, you know, when we go places, and especially uh, countries like Austria or Germany or something, there's so, so many beautiful castles, palaces, churches to visit. And as a visitor, even when you didn't prepare yourself, you run into you think, and you want to go in. You want to see that building. You want to smell a bit about the, 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 the life in there. And, and some venues are really good. They kept even the furniture. Uh, they kept uh, the musical instruments they had at the time, and they were almost untouched for 300, 400 years, you know? Then next to it, I think, uh, it's interesting. Of course, as a visitor, you want to get inside such a building. But imagine that you live in such a building for your entire life. It might also become a little bit like a prison, in your thought, and you want to escape the strict rules of being part of aristocracy or royalty and you still see that like you almost you don't have a normal life if you if you're a member of a royal family you're constantly followed by paparazzi uh, people tend to actually rather come up with gossip about you than the truth right so um i, I found it highly symbolic this this window uh, so actually maybe when you live inside or you have lived inside for 20, 30 years, you want to get out, right? Uh, the, th the third reason why I picked this program, uh, because uh, the wonderful Sydney Tumalan, uh, who will be playing viola da gamba, uh, wonderful player, uh, she studied here and um, she absolutely loved the early music repertoire and then decided to actually spend the rest of her artistic career with, with playing Baroque cello and viola da gamba. But I've, I've invited her a few times to tours and, and uh, a few happened also in, in, in Austria and southern Germany. And uh, she was staying at the house of my best friend who is actually a top-notch doctor at the Children's Hospital in the heart of Munich. And I think I had to go to another place, Passau, to, to give a workshop. And my friend, his wife is also a doctor. They simply forgot to give Sydney the keys when she was leaving and she was off to the airport. And <laughs> Sydney didn't have another choice to just to jump out of the window. And it was pretty high, I can assure you that. It was at least five to six feet high or something. But she did it with her suitcase, with her instrument. So I still admire her for not bursting out in tears and taking this initiative. <laughs> and so here, uh, a, 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 few, a few ideas to the, to the title of this uh, program. So throughout this program, uh, also try to be playing trio sonatas, uh, where uh, uh, I mostly play the top part, of course, and then Sydney will play a concertante bass line. That means it's actually more than playing what we call basso continuo, the following bass. And so normally you have a solo sonata in high baroque, for one solo instrument, it can be anything, violin, flute, uh, bassoon, oboe, you name it. And then you would, like in a jazz trio, you know, like the, 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 the most basic form of a jazz trio would be piano, drums and bass. Anything else is luxury. You can add a guitar, you can add a, a singer, you can add a saxophone, but this is basic. Basic in Baroque is you have one solo instrument, with bass continuo, mostly played on a keyboard. 
harpsichord, sometimes organ, sometimes other obscure keyboards, and a, a bass instrument, but actually supporting mostly, it's, it's more or less written like a duet, although there are three people. The difference here with some somewhat earlier repertoire, 17th century, is actually that there are three independent lines. Top part, concertante bass line, which actually is very often in conversation with the top part, and also partly takes care of the accompaniment. And so I, I love this uh, repertoire because it's constantly in, uh, in conversation between top and bass. We'll start the work with a completely unknown composer, Johann Michael Nikolai, uh, and his, uh, you know, I, I picked it for a reason, because I think we'll, when people will hear the first couple of bars, it will remind them of what is in this country probably the most performed piece of music at a wedding. Namely, I'm talking about Pachel Bell's Canon. Uh, I'm sure, uh, because it's a sort of a harmonical progression, which you can repeat over and over, and you, you put beautiful variations on top, of course. But I'm sure, I'm convinced, uh, and, and Nikolai was not the only one, but I found it also actually in some other pieces, that Pachelbel was not the inventor of this harmonical sequence. Uh, he just used it to create his own, and there are fantastic variations on top of it. Um, then, of course, within this program, also trying to find a nice balance uh, with pieces for any uh, of our instruments. Of course, James will be playing uh, two harpsichord solos. Um, so, within this program, um, towards the end, I added some, some German composers from the 18th century. Um, one is a funny, a really funny concerto by probably Gottlieb Heine, although in the manuscript it says anonymous, but there are some notes, it's, a, it's just for recorder and harpsichord, so there's no bass to it, that it was, it says in French, well, it's not 100% waterproof French in, in Germany, but everybody had to learn French at the time, that it was written for Princess uh, Amélie, so famous princess of Prussia at the time, uh, in, in, in Berlin, and there's still a library called Amalien, and named after her, and I found this work in here. We end this program with a trio sonata, specifically written for the combination we have for this, this concert, so that means recorder and viola da gamba and harpsichord, uh, written by Telemann. Um, he published this work himself, and so we were talking a little bit about entrepreneurship uh, starting at the beginning of the 18th century. He, he was a Kapellmeister in Hamburg, Freistadt, so the free city of Hamburg. And he actually made quite a living with it. But in life he was not very, very lucky actually. Uh, we, we actually just presented a, an old Tenemann program here at UNT, I think three weeks ago or something, and then uh, I dove a little bit into his life and what he wrote about his own life himself, which we find in some interesting encyclopedias uh, from the time. And I couldn't resist also putting a few quotes in the, in the program, uh, because again, I want to make the new generation aware that they're definitely not the only ones having a hard time sometimes. Tenemann, <laughs> this is very interesting. Uh, his mother was strongly, strongly opposed to the idea that he would become a musician. She said, you cannot make a living with it, you cannot earn your own bread. You will become, uh, she used the words, uh, a wandering squirrel if you uh, want to become a musician. So, actually, his mother almost forced him to study law in Magdeburg, in, in Germany. 
But he was writing it, it's so, and he uses some, some quotes from, from Greek or Roman poets, actually, to describe his feeling. He said, what, what's in the bones is in the flesh. So I felt guilty, but I, I couldn't stop. So I was secretly composing in the middle of the night. I was uh, practicing my instruments uh, secretly. I had to, to, to hide my instrument, but then they discovered it, and my instruments were taken away. And then, yes, I thought I would have to obey my mom, and so he went to Magdeburg and studied law. But then he started composing again, and slowly be became successful with it, and then was, was highly accepted already by, by experts of the time. So, in that sense, I found all the repertoire very inspiring and still very creative. For me, it's definitely not obscure and I'm, I'm just flabbergasted by the amount of fantasy and quality 